Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Chris Brown, and I will be your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada, and we will learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we believe that the best way to understand a community is to talk to people who live and work there. That is why we are honored to have our guest on today. Please help me welcome to the show Mayor Pat Fuel of the town of Strathmore in the province of Alberta. Pat, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this. I'm a little worried, but um, <laughs> I think you'll help me get through it. I certainly will help you get through it, but I want to start by getting to know who Pat Fuel is. So, Pat, my very first question to all my guests is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, I was a high school phys ed and English teacher for 34 years, and uh, so I've always been involved in volunteer coaching. I coached boys basketball for about 20 years and then high school girls basketball for about six. So I've always volunteered within the school and so I got to know a lot of the students from the town from the county from Siksika Nation and uh, I think it always just instilled this idea that you do need to volunteer for things and so uh, yeah that that got me into the volunteering aspect as far as coaching and then as uh, the thing that made me run I guess I, I ran for council first in 2010 and uh, was elected for two terms as a councillor. And then after the seven years, I put my name in for mayor because uh, I had hit the retirement age for teaching. And I thought, well, I'll throw my my name in and I wound up winning two terms uh, and retired from teaching uh, almost right away. I gave my 30 day notice as soon as I was elected uh, mayor in 2017. But the thing that made me run initially in 2010 is um, I had children growing up in Strathmore. I have a son and a daughter who are now in their 30s. But back then, there weren't really a lot of options for them to ride bikes and to, to get outdoors and do a lot of things. So I wanted to try to uh, work to improve the parks and the pathway system in Strathmore. Uh, we're on the Baldass Prairie, too. So we're I've always been um, wanting to have a lot of trees in our green space. So I, I guess that aspect was the main thing that, that got me interested in running. And then I was really big on trying to advance Strathmore and, and progress it in a manner where we can still be a, a close-knit uh, town, but also be progressive in our thoughts and, and our the way we express ourselves and the way we are as residents. I knew we were having immigration coming in, a lot of a lot of people who were first-time Canadians, and I, I wanted to be a part of that as well. You, you We're going to talk a little bit more about Strathmore and your role as mayor a little bit uh, later in the interview, but I want to stick on who you are. What was the draw to municipal politics? Because you could have chosen provincial to help give back to your community you could have chosen federal but you chose municipally um was it just that local community angle or was it you wanted to stay close to home because you weren't going to be going up to edmonton weren't be going to uh, ottawa and you'd be staying close to strathmore yeah the main thing i, I guess is i wanted to stay close to strathmore um my kids are all get uh, my kids had all grown up and they were had moved on to university and college sports. So I wanted to be close to Calgary so I could still support them in their adult sports pursuits. Uh, and, and and then the other thing was, and I've learned this from our uh, MP, Martin Shields, who was the former mayor of Brooks. And, and one of the, his comments that has stuck with me, and it makes sense when I look back on everything, is that you, you make the most absolute day-to-day -day difference in municipal government. You make decisions at council on a Wednesday night, for example, and it can have real direct impact within a short period of time with the people that you live with and, and recreate with and, and meet at the co-op or, or at Sobeys or whatever. So there's there's a real di direct connection with, with people when you, when you work in municipal government. And I thought that I'd be able to stay home, stay close to my kids, still continue teaching when I was a counselor, and, and just be a part of the community and make decisions that you'd see impacts on. Like, for example, I was on the uh, Wheatland Housing Management Body, which deals with our seniors lodge. 
So as a committee member on that, when I was a new counselor, you know, you'd be making decisions on purchases like uh, vegetable steamers. I know it might sound silly, but you know, so you can keep the food warmer for the for the residents and the lodge or to have the roof redone. So, you know, you're making decisions that are impacting, you know, in my case, as a former teacher, I'm impacting former parents of kids who I taught way back in the 80s when I first started. And so, you know, you're impacting people and and helping them in their in their day to day lives. So I really like that part about municipal government. And I really didn't want I never even considered running for provincial uh, office, mainly because I wanted to stay home. I didn't want to be traveling to Edmonton too, but I really wanted to be involved in my own community because I we, I came here in 1983, fresh out of the University of Calgary. It was my first teaching job. I fell in love with the town uh, and, and I've been you know kind of teased over the years because uh, my wife and I both grew up in Canmore. So we left the beautiful Rocky Mountains, got teaching jobs here and never went back home. And and I've had people say, you, you chose the prairie over staying in mountains? What were you thinking? But the people in Strathmore are amazing. They look out for each other. They're friendly in stores. Uh, they get into volunteering. They're supportive. We have a mix of uh, of an urban style of, of uh, living in, in Strathmore, but we also have we have the farmlands around us. We have county residents who come into town. So there's a real Western ranching farming feel. Uh, we also have six sicker residents come into town for shopping services school. So it's a real uh, collecting place of a lot of different types of people and culture. And uh, the town is just an amazing place and we didn't want to ever leave. And then once you start teaching and you get to know people and you get to know students, it becomes harder and harder to leave. And then our proximity to, to Calgary just made it perfect to stay too. You 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 chose to get involved municipally in 2010. Prior to 2010, had politics ever crossed your mind that you ever thought to yourself, one day I'm going to have my name on the ballot? Or was it just a, a, a kind of a fluke in some sense that you decided in 2010 you wanted to give back? So let's do it politically. Yeah, and you know, to be to be honest, which I've really tried to be a politician who's been honest through his whole term, I was the last person that I would have thought would want to be on council or mayor. And I'll I'll do a little confession here because I was raised Catholic, but uh, I was one of the teachers who, at our monthly staff meetings, would be cracking jokes in the back or or really not always on task at some of the more mundane parts of a of a high school staff meeting. So to project into the future, I never would have thought I'd run for politics. It came pretty quick. It was in the summer of 2010. I was just, you know, sitting around talking with my wife and the elections were coming up and I knew I had some frustrations with parks and playgrounds. And I thought maybe I can run on that and, and then be a part of uh, moving things forward in Strathmore. And so it wasn't necessarily on a lark or a whim, but the decision came pretty fast. I think I think I shocked my wife and my kids. And I think a lot of people in general thought, wow, he's running for council. Hmm, who'd, who'd have thought? And here I am uh, 13 years later. So you decided to put your name forward in 2010. You seem to have a pulse on the community. You seem to know what the issues are because you're a teacher at the time and you're yeah. dealing with people on a day-to-day -day basis. But looking back on that first campaign and subsequent campaigns since, you might always assume what the issues are going to be, but you always, when you talk to people at their doors, at the grocery store, you hear local micro issues. Are there issues that you look back on in, in that first campaign and go, wow, I'm I'm glad someone raised that because in my 13 years in office, I've been able to address these issues. Yeah, that's a really good question. One of the burning campaign issues in 2010 was our downtown core. There were many uh, buildings and spaces that were that were empty. They weren't rented out. So there was a real fear that our downtown had lost its character and, and was empty and what were we going to do about that? So that was one of the things I listened to from people. And and in my last, uh, in my 13 years on council, we've brought in a lot of changes. I went to conferences on revitalizing downtown and 
downtowns. And we've really put in some steps that have helped. Like, for example, one of the conferences I went to said, if you're going to save a downtown, you need to have residents living down there. So immediately we worked with staff to, to change zoning and to allow for more multi-unit housing in the downtown area. And, uh, and that helped bring people downtown. And then we also uh, did over the 13 years, we, we renovated or rehabilitated uh, the main street, which is second Avenue in our town. We, we uh, did all the infrastructure below. We narrowed the road a little bit to, to slow down traffic. We, um, widened parking lots a bit and we added uh, bump outs we added trees and shrubs and benches to beautify both those streets and and then the other thing that was controversial at the time but I think is is really paying off is we decided that the third aspect besides rehabilitating the road and getting more people living downtown we uh, we were in need of a new town office the old town office was pretty run down and it was pretty small for our staff it was quite cramped we had to use uh, portables outside in the back to to house all our staff so we decided the third aspect of saving the downtown would be to, to put our money where our mouth is and and build a, a new municipal building right downtown so we have a really nice park in our downtown area with a with a, a, a storm pond that's kind of like a lake and it has a walking path all around it so we have our new town hall right down right down here and what that does is it brings 60 to 70 staff downtown every day to work. So they might go at lunch for a, for a sandwich somewhere or buy lottery tickets or get a prescription. But there's that energy downtown. And then any seniors or people who pay their bills come downtown to the, to the new town offices, builders and developers who are coming here. And then when I have meetings with, with different groups, service groups or or someone with our CAO will often use a restaurant in the downtown area. We try to spread out our bookings, you know, to support all businesses. But there's just more of an energy by by bringing our staff down here and people doing regular town business coming to the downtown core. Uh, we also have a really nice farmers market building right in our in our downtown Kinsman Park where the town office is, and it's uh, it's solar powered. It's got uh, lighting. It's got a paved parking lot now, so we have uh, we have weekly uh, farmers markets right in the downtown area. We have a show and shine down here for classic cars. We just wanted to continue to support the downtown businesses and bring energy and people here in this in this downtown area. So that's that was an issue in the 2010 campaign, and I really think that my past councils and I worked hard to to try to to try to save the downtown. And now we have a situation where there's very few places to rent in the downtown core as a recent visitor to your community i was i stopped in a few weeks ago on my way back from another community i got a got to see firsthand the new uh, strathmore town hall and i can say i'm not sure if it's relatively new but um it is probably one of the most best looking town halls i've seen in a very long time so you got to be happy Thank about you. that Thank um, you. We took uh, we took some hits publicly on bringing it downtown. People were afraid we were stealing, taking land from the park to to do it. But we stayed in the parking lot, and went with a two story, so that we wouldn't have a big footprint on the parking lot. And I can imagine always spending money on a council project like something like a town hall that may yeah. not impact residents as a street or underground part or underground uh, pipes would be a little bit challenging as well in the political realm that we live in today. Yeah, <laughs> I, there were, there were a couple comments on Facebook that I was going to have a rooftop deck and, uh, and that never was part of any plan, but that became one of the little rumors about the new town hall. I want to go back to the 2010 campaign again, and I want to talk about election night for a second. Walking into the ballot box and seeing your name on that ballot is a unique experience that not a lot of people can say they've experienced, but you have four times since um, I've had it, the ability to do that. What was that experience like for you walking into that ballot box and putting that X or that check mark beside your name? And do you still get that same feeling today in this in the last election that you got in the first election? Yeah, the first election was really surreal because, again, my, my thought process had never been getting into politics. Uh, so I made the decision fairly quickly over that summer. So, yeah, seeing my name on the ballot box and, and uh, getting the results on the night of election and, and doing as well as I did was, was really heartwarming. And I'm, I was so grateful to the public 
so yeah, that was really, really exciting. Um, my family was all, you know, really interested and captivated following everything that was going on. As it gone on, the second term, it wasn't, you know, quite the same level of excitement, but I actually improved on my vote count in my second term. So that reassured me that I was that I was listening to people, that I was on the right track, that I was uh, doing what they felt was was good work and that they had confidence in, in me. When I ran for mayor, it was uh, it was kind of terrifying because uh, um, I knew I was near the age of retiring from teaching, and I had a plan that if I if I didn't win the mayor uh, title, I would stay teaching for another three or four years. And if I did win, I was facing a massive change in my lifestyle, so it was a little bit frightening. Um, and it was a it was a two person race, and that night was exciting in that. I did really, really well. I had a, a very strong uh, turnout for support. I wound up getting 86% 80%, of the, the vote that night. So that was almost like I was in awe of how I had kind of gone from someone who wasn't going to go on council, who who got elected twice and then put it put his name in for the top position and then wound up winning quite decisively. So it was shocking. It was um, humbling. And, and I was just super grateful to the people of Strathmore who, again, showed support. And then I knew I I had to totally change my life and put in a 30-day notice of uh, retirement, which which was sad because I, I loved teaching. I had every day I laughed at school. I loved working with high school students. They made me think. They frustrated me at times. But every day was different. You just never knew what exactly was going to happen. And 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 I knew that um, there may not be as many laughs in my new career as there was as a phys ed and English teacher in high school. And and that has come to be true. So yeah, it, it was uh, it was really good. And then in my last election, I was more determined to try to get on one more term because we had come through uh, the COVID situation and I knew I was going to lose votes because I took a pretty strong stand and I was the figurehead and the spokesperson for following the government line as far as trying to protect people. So I knew I was going to take a hit and there were three other people who ran. So my numbers went down, but I, I still wound up doing really well and, and winning. And it was a late, late vote count. My kids were all on edge. My wife was on edge. And I think in that election, it was, it was a kind of a, a relief and a, Okay, wow, it's it's back to work. I, I got through a, a really difficult time because we had a we had a murder in 2019 in town, and there was uh, some some racial things we had to address as a town, and and we took ownership for things, and we worked really hard with Siksika Nation. So that was 2019, and then a year later, COVID hit. So I'm I'm this phys ed English teacher who suddenly dealing with the ramifications of a murder and a worldwide pandemic and and uh, I, I just had to take advice from experts and try to do the best I could. So each of those elections was totally different. The first one was eye-opening and, and uh, you know, sudden. Second one, I felt reassured. Third one, I was flabbergasted by the support and really, really grateful to the public. And the fourth one was kind of a relief and, and a knowledge that I was going to take a hit, but they, there was still the majority of people stuck with me. So I was really grateful. You bring up a good sort of segment that I wasn't going to talk about, but you, you certainly kind of addressed it here as mayor, as counselor, you have to address a lot of issues that get thrown your way. Provincially, federally, you do too, but you have civil service, you have staff members as counselors and mayors, you don't have the same resources that, say, provincial or federal governments may have. You have a smaller pool, but you have to address these issues, whether it be COVID, whether it be a murder, whether it be revitalization of the downtown core. How do you do it? Because I can imagine it is challenging from time to time to address so many issues on a regular basis, but the people have elected you to do it. How have you find that balance to address the issues that come your way on a, on an ongoing basis? Well, I, I kind of have three, I don't know if you'd call them models, but three things that have kind of kept me through, kept me going through teaching. And, and it, I've kind of applied them to, uh, to the mayor as well. And one is as a teacher, 
uh, you're supposed to act in, in a term called in loco parentis. So we act as if a normal caring parent, what would a normal care, caring parent do for a child in school? So I always tried to keep that in my mind. If, if I had an injury, what would a caring parent do? Like, how do I deal with this situation so that I do it the right way and I, I, I run the least risk of causing harm to the student or or to myself in general. So that was one. Second thing is I've always followed the mantra or the, the motto of uh, err on the side of caution. And, and I've always felt that with students, you know, if, if you've got a student who uh, may be struggling and is struggling with deadlines and getting something in on time, I would try to find out what's going on with the student in the student's life. And you don't want to just make a blanket or you can hand things in late, but you try to find out what's going on. And, and again, in an injury situation, if, if you've got an injury, don't take it lightly. Treat it as if it's always going to be potentially serious and you have less chance to run into trouble. So that became really important. Those two things became really important as far as dealing with uh, critical things uh, like the COVID situation. I, I thought, well, what would a caring parent do as far as children and, and youth as far as uh, the virus is concerned? Um, and erring on the side of caution. Have I got more to lose by downplaying this virus or by taking it seriously? And I know that people suffered by having to be isolated and some people don't trust vaccines, but I had to think in terms of uh, what's the least amount of uh, damage that I can do and, 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 and how should I proceed as far as treating this? And so I took the lead and, and spoke up and, and followed a lot of the government procedures because they're the, they were the experts. And I wanted to make sure that I was erring on the side of the caution and acting the way a parent might for people and just make decisions that way. And then I, I honestly don't have regrets because every, every decision I was involved in, whether it be a mask bylaw or encouraging vaccination or being a part of uh, limiting hours and recreation facilities during COVID. It was all done to try to help as many people as we could, because in the early months, we didn't know how bad this was going to be. And obviously it, it, it was far more serious than, than a regular flu and a lot of people did pass away. And then uh, the third one I've always kept in my mind is that I was I was told in our counselor training in my first term that when you make decisions, you try to always keep in mind what's the best decision for the majority of your residents. So if you're planning a if you're planning a new commercial development and it's in a neighborhood, but it's going to be massive and and uh, and things like that, how how is this going to impact? The majority of your residents. So I really tried to do that. And that helped me through the COVID situation too, because, you know, you're putting in these, these, um, or you're implementing a lot of safety and health procedures. And the idea was how can we help protect the majority of our residents? And that kept me going. There's a sign right behind you over top of your shoulder that says teamwork. Yeah. And I want to ask about teamwork. I'm not, I'm not talking yeah. about what the rest, but how much of that comes into play when it comes to municipal government, because provincially you have side, you have liberal, conservative, green, NDP, but mm -hmm. municipally parties don't matter. You are team Strathmore. How much does teamwork come into play when it comes to municipal government? Well, I think it's really important because uh, you have people from all walks of life who get on council. So they have separate and, and different kind of views as far as their vision for the town. You have to find a way to try to make everybody feel valued and important, even if you don't always disagree. And you try to get everybody working together for the common good of the town. So yeah, the, the, the sign has a little bit of a humorous <laughs> saying, but teamwork I think is really important. And then as a mayor, you're managing six other personalities, six other egos, six other feelings. And you, it's almost like coaching a team or being a player coach on a team because everybody has their own ideas and, and they have their different ways of presenting their ideas, uh, how they react to controversy or disagreements on council. You have to find ways that you can try to keep everyone together. And teamwork is, I think, really important. Um, I, I, I just don't know. I don't know how American cities can, can, can run the way they, they do when 
the mayors declare whether they're a Democrat or a Republican, because to me, you, you automatically cut out people from who might be on board with you by separating yourself through political affiliation. So I like the fact that there's no political parties that people know that I'm trying to be the best mayor I can for the majority of residents, no matter what you believe in, who you vote for. Uh, it's the town that comes first and our council is, is a really good council. We're trying to pull together as a team. We've had some really good debate, really, really, you know, disagreements, but but uh, no real animosity or anger. We just move on to the next item and 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 away we go. So teamwork has has worked with this group. Um, like I said, we're all from different walks of life, and it's it's just been really good to see the different uh, personalities with their talent levels come come become uh, important parts of the council. And I really appreciate them. I want to turn to the town of Strathmore now as, as a whole. And before I do that, I want to preface this by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion at council. This is not a direction of council. This is his opinion. Um, mayor Fuel, I want to ask the question uh, about the town in general. In your opinion, as of at the time of this recording, what is the biggest issue or issues facing your community today? Well, there's a, a couple issues that are really important. Uh, one is we're we've had slow, steady growth for many, many years, and it's it's been manageable, and it's been you know you're able to provide services, you're able to to grow and improve the town because the growth has been slow and steady, and we're kind of an undiscovered gem. People think we're you know, kind of far from Calgary, and I wouldn't want to live there because we're too far, but you can go door to door from my house to downtown Calgary in about 40, 45 minutes, and most of it's highway travel, so it's really good, and, and for people wanting to commute to the big city of Calgary, the sun's always at your back. If you go in the morning, the sun's behind you, come home, the sun's behind you, and we're close enough, but the, the big challenge we're facing is and it's a bit of a worry for me as our slow, steady growth is about to go, I think, in the opposite direction, because this council has worked really hard to attract industry and in Wheatland County, which we uh, reside in, has also made some incredible gains as far as industry. And there is going to be a need for housing and residents being able to live close to where they work. We have a, a new large industry called Phytoorganics which uh, is a plant that removes uh, protein from yellow peas. So we have our farmers in the area who can, who can uh, pivot, not to use the line from friends, but they can pivot and start to grow yellow peas if they want, and then they extract the protein. And that's going to be about 200 jobs to build the plant and about 70 jobs to work in it. So those people will need places to live in Strathmore area. And Wheatland County just recently announced that the de Havilland airplane plant uh, building facility is, is going to be uh, about, about 10 kilometers or so uh, west of us. And that's going to be a massive plant where they'll be manufacturing airplanes and water bombers. And the staff is going to need places to live and commute. So I believe, and this is everything I've been told, Strathmore is about to have a boom in residential. And that. That worries me. It's a challenge because we have the land. We annexed land quite a while ago. A previous council annexed land. We have the land, but we're going to have to be able to find a way to manage that growth and get the infrastructure in and work with developers and builders for different products and what is needed in the town as far as types of housing. And people have always loved Strathmore as being this small, friendly town. And I think we're going to be, we're, we're probably at 15,000 right now, and we're going to see a real increase in our population. And we may have to look at it as being, we'll move towards being a big friendly town and, and not so much a small town anymore. So that's one of the challenges we face. So I want to pick up there for a second, and I want to talk about housing. And understandable that growth is needed and growth is important. Uh, putting infrastructure is needed. But developers are also important. How how are developers coming, knocking on your door, saying we want to develop? Because right now there's a lot of communities like yours who are facing a housing crisis. Um, yeah. So how do you attract re or developers to come to your community and start building in your community compared to 
40 kilometers down the road where Calgary is. And that is the big issue I think a lot of communities like yours are facing. So how is Strathmore trying to address this? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, luckily, a lot of our builder developers already own property in town. So they we have been starting and we've had some meetings with them early in the new year. And, you know, a couple of the builders are saying, you know, our, our phases, our next phase is all sold out. We are ready to start ground moving in the spring. So it's exciting. It's thrilling, but it's also a bit terrifying too. So they're ready. Our existing builders have some subdivisions ready to roll. So that's good. Um, the other thing is the the, the company, the, uh, the people involved in De Havilland have bought two uh, uh, quarter sections of land in our town, but on the west boundary of our town. So inside our west uh, boundaries, and they're also ready to go. So I've had meetings with... Uh, with their housing division to talk about what types of housing we need. And so, yeah, we have we have a, a good situation as far as there's a lot of land that's available. We have established builders who are ready to go. They've, they've owned land in town for quite a while. They've been waiting for the economy to turn around. I, I know everybody's been hit hard by the, the, COVID, uh, the COVID situation and what that did to the economy. Uh, and then now with the new builders coming in and hopefully using local trades on the new lands that, that the Haviland people have bought, we're ready and primed for a lot of growth. You you talk about growth, and I want to preface this by saying growth is important, but sustainable growth is also important. I think that's the key word that I want to use when asking this question. There is a lot of issues right now going on in the world, and especially the cost of uh, cost of doing business has gone through the roof, and municipalities are feeling the blunt of that because you can't just go pave a road and make a road because it's going to cost more than it did 10 years ago, heck, even three years ago. How do you grow with the tax base that you have now, but understand that if you don't grow – these residents are not going to come and then you're not going to be able to expand other issues. So how do you do sustainable growth in a economic time that we live in? Well, one of the good things for Strathmore is we've been a slowly growing community that has a lot of amenities. We have a golf course, we have a twin arena, we have multiple school gyms, outdoor basketball courts, an 18 disc golf course. We have a, quite new uh, sports center that has soccer, uh, an indoor soccer field. Uh, it's attached to our, our a new K-9 school. So there's the school gym, uh, school court, and then there's a town court. We have an area that pickleball has, uh, has adopted and are playing. And then on the upper level, we have a five-lane walking track. So we're fortunate in that we don't have to, at this time, look to find money to build recreation facilities because we've slowly been doing it. And with the sports center, it was, it was just a great opportunity. We collaborated with Golden Hill School Division and Wheatland County and our town, and then the, the builder and owner of land where it is. Because what happened was the, the school division, our superintendent, Bev Daver, Bevan Davern, came to us with this idea of doing a sports center attached to a K-9 to school. So the school division put in a lot of money. Strathmore put in, I think the school division put in two million. We put in, um, I think we put in five million. The county put in two. The builder donated the land, just gave it to the. To, so we were able to get a a ten million dollar uh, building uh, for us putting in in five. And it's it's it was a it was a great economic situation to partner like that. And it was. Uh, it was great to get a facility that, that Wheatland, Siksika, and Strathmore residents could use. It would help the school system. So, yeah, we, we've, we've had challenges and um, the economy has been tight. But as we go into the future, even with the inflation, I believe we're in a really good situation because we have amenities and we don't have to. We, we also have a wastewater treatment plant that was put in by council quite a few years ago, and they went way beyond Alberta environment standards. They, in, I've always been told they put in the Cadillac of wastewater treatment plants, if you can imagine comparing a Cadillac to that facility with what goes in and into it. <clears throat> anyway, moving along. Uh, yeah, I, want, have, I uh, want to jump and, in and, here and, for a and, second because growth is, 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 is important, and I completely agree with you. 
But there's also the flip side to growth because there's probably about a handful. I'm just not, I'm not saying how many, I'm just saying there's probably a handful of people in your community who say, I don't want growth. I don't want mm. the the town to grow because I like the small town feel. I want it to yeah. stay as is. I moved here for this type of feel. And if you continue to grow, it's going to take away that charm that I, I came to Strathmore for. How do you balance that? Or do you have to just, as you said in our previous statement, in our segment one, you have to look at the town as a whole and you can't worry about some and I hate to say minority of views, but you have to look at the majority of people compared to the minority of people. Yeah, it's a tough balancing act because you do have a, a, a chunk of people who want to stay small, but progress is inevitable. And and then the other side of that, which we heard in this latest campaign, is, is people wanted to have more industry in the town and in the area. They wanted, their, they wanted a chance for their young people to stay in Strathmore, not have to move away for school and then move farther away for jobs. So there's that mix of trying to, to stay like a small town atmosphere and feel, but there's another chunk of people who want to see industry come here. And when industry comes here, you're going to have more jobs, you're going to have people moving in, and that's going to impact the growth of the town. So it's a real tough balancing act and and you just i don't think you can stop progress i think your point is really well is well made you try to find a way to manage that growth and i don't think that a, that as we grow i i still think strathmore can be an incredibly friendly western kind of a ranching farming town even if we make 20,000 as a population in the next seven years or so, I think we can still be that same kind of a town. It'll change. There's got to be change, but that's it's it's inevitable to have progress. We just want to be able to manage it. Now, you've talked about a few issues that you believe are the most depressing issues that are facing your community. But if I go talk to 100 people in your community tomorrow and I ask them that same question, what is the biggest issue? They're going to give me some some of those macro issues, growth, mm -hmm. infrastructure, but then they're going to talk about the micro issues. The I need the park in my neighborhood upgraded because it hasn't been upgraded in five years, 10 years. I need a pothole that's in front of my house fixed. How do you take the micro issues that are important because they are important to the people who have addressed them and move the city forward without leaving people behind? Because you only have a certain amount of money each year. You can't run deficits. How do you see yourself as mayor and council trying to address the individual needs while trying to address the town needs? Yeah, again, tough balance <laughs> because there are there are certain nagging issues that we're going through in the last month because this has been a, a really heavy snowfall winter in, in Strathmore area. And so the age old problem of snow removal, people would love to have their streets plowed right to the pavement and they don't want any any snow to go to be plowed in front of driveways but in order to take the snow completely away and and never have a snow row in front of any driveway it's incredibly expensive so you try to to find ways to manage it we have a, a snow for example we have a snow reserve that we've created where if you have a, a winter that's mild with not heavy snow and you don't spend a lot of the money that you've budgeted for snow ro removal Instead of putting that into general revenues, we can put it into a snow removal revenue to be used in the next year's uh, budget for snow removal if there's a heavy snowfall situation. So that kind of planning can help. We've been working really hard as a council to improve our reserves, our, our cash reserves and infrastructure in different areas uh, so that we can be ready for, for certain things that pop up or if or if residents come forward and and we need some playground equipment totally replaced in a in a well used park, we can have reserves or a funding source for things like that, as well as the big ticket items. Uh, coming back to your question about challenges, one of the big challenges Strathmore faces, and I know other communities in Calgary too are facing it, is achievable or I guess the word is it used to be affordable, but now we're starting to hear attainable housing. So we need housing that's affordable for a lot of people. And, and that's what we're working towards now as well. It's in our strategic plan. It's one of our, our, our points, our, our initiatives that we need to try to work towards as far as having affordable housing. 
but it also has to be affordable housing of the right style. You know, sometimes you have properties that come along in existing areas and you have to balance putting in something that's affordable housing that's also going to fit in the established community so that residents aren't negatively impacted by a, a lot of the things that might be associated with a large build. So it's a, it's a, again, it's balancing trying to find properties, trying to find builders that can build uh, properties that will be attainable or achievable by, um, by an average person. Well, before we turn to our last segment, because I am cautious of time here, sure. I want to ask this. If I was to come talk to you at the end of this year, at the end of 2023, and say, hey, Pat, what's up? Long time no see. Remember our conversation way back in uh, March? I would about... tour you around town. Well, first off, I'm coming to your community <laughs> again, and we're going to do that. But okay. I want to I want to know what do you and council see as the biggest issue that you need to address in 2023 that at the end of the year, if I came to you and said, Hey, did you get your issue started, resolved, fixed, or even on the agenda? What would be that issue? And what is the uh, goalpost that you've tried to put in place for 2023 to make sure that you've achieved it? Yeah, good question. I think, um, because we just don't know what this <laughs> boom is going to be like or how big it's going to hit this year, I think it's it's having our staff ready in the planning um, department as far as issuing permits, um, inspections. We just don't know how big and how fast and how soon everything is going to start. So I would say that's the biggest thing we face for this year. How are we going to manage what looks like it's going to be a bit of a boom in residential? We're ready as far as, well, the school division, we're blessed to have two school divisions that are really progressive and, and solid, and they're ready for more students. We've got we've got a, an approval for a new public school to be, to be built. They're going to be uh, de demolishing an, an older school and rebuilding a new one. We have, a, we have a Christ the Redeemer separate school. We have a Christian Academy in our public system. So schools are ready. We have the amenities. Um, it's just we have to be ready for this residential growth that I believe is going to hit. So that one. And then while this residential growth is happening, maybe it's, it's well, it's definitely coupled because as you have the residential growth, you need to have a balance of types of housing. And we need housing that, uh, that people can achieve, that can that can be afforded either to rent or purchase. Maybe it's a starter home or a first, first or second rental that you've had, but we need to find housing for all different types of people. That's going to be the key, and it's all tied to the growth. It's like a train's coming uh, in a tunnel, and we haven't quite seen the light coming at us yet, but it's coming. I want to turn to our last segment because I sure. am cautious of time. And this is my favorite part of this series is to talk about tourism. I love tourism. I love touring small communities. I love visiting communities. And I've made a pledge. If you come on my show, I'm coming to your community to spend my hard earned economic dollars in your community. So mayor fuel, as I have listeners across Canada and around the world, what would people do in the town of Strathmore if they were coming to your community? Well, we have, like I said, we've all had all sorts of amenities. We ha we have an amazing amount of sunshine. That's one of the reasons we leased land for a solar plant. So sunshine is key here. We have mild Chinooks. But as far as tourism events, our, our biggest one that we're fully supportive of, and we work hard with the Strathmore and District Agricultural Society, we have the Strathmore Stampede the long weekend in August every year. And it brings thousands and thousands of people here. There's a parade on the Saturday morning. They, they have a midway. Uh, the chuck wagons that you will see in the professional circuit at uh, the Calgary Stampede and High River, they're here as part of their, their tour. We have uh, the rodeo with all sorts of rodeo events, bareback, uh, saddle bronc, um, you know, uh, bull riding, all of that is here. And uh, it brings in so many people and it's just a real Western feel. There are great, great seating opportunities where they're starting to have more musical events there too. So that's something if, if people who are watching the podcast want to just check out the Strathmore and District Agriculture, Agricultural Society website, 
they will find all sorts of information on that because it's the it's the big draw for that long weekend in August. And people start bringing in RVs by about the Monday of the week going into the Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So yeah, it's a it's a big thing. We have all sorts of events that that go on here. As I said, we have a really nice outdoor farmers market that we're trying to grow as a town. Um, we have a we have an annual classic car show called the Strathmore Show and Shine. That's big. Our Canada Day celebrations are massive. We have a a big budget for fireworks. There's all sorts of events downtown. We have we have an outdoor amphitheater as well in our Kinsman Park where the town hall and, and farmers market building are. And we have music and, and different performances there as well. Um, the other thing that we have in the works coming is uh, we have a gentleman. Strathmore was founded on immigrants coming across on the railway. And so CPR had, uh, had Im um, they had demonstration farms and orchards here so that immigrants who came from other countries could see what would grow here and what things they could plant on the farmland they might have bought. So this gentleman is bringing in a legacy project where he wants to recreate the old style of, of you know, farms and orchards and show what it was like to farm and ranch here at the turn of the century. And coupled with that will be hopefully an RV park and some commercial uh, industry that's tied into, into things that the town needs like uh, agricultural uh, business into the future. So uh, there's, there's a real exciting thing that's coming down the road. Uh, another thing is we have a strong relationship with Siksika Nation and the young man who was killed in Strathmore four years ago uh, was a man named uh, Christian, a young man. And he was a student here in, in the schools. He came all through the education system here. He played on our sports team. He was heavily involved in minor hockey and tragically his life was taken. But his mother, Melody, has really worked hard with the town and um, and other people to uh, to bring this powwow to Strathmore. And it's gonna be held at the Strathmore Motor Products Sports Center. There'll be dancers and drummers and people from all over Canada and the US to take part and to perform in, in native regalia. And we we worked really hard to to make this powwow something that's that's gonna be something special to to honor Christian. I want to turn to my last question in this segment, and it's about you and you and your community. After a stressful day at council, after a long day of meetings with uh, stakeholders or just day-to-day -day business of, the, of being the mayor of a town, where do you go to decompress in the community? Is there a local watering hole or do you just like to curl up on the couch and just watch a show, watch friends to pivot something? Or what do you <laughs> like to do after a long day? Well, typically, if I can, if we get done early enough on a, on a council night, uh, some of us might go for wings at a, at a local uh, lounge, wings, and I'll typically have a Diet Coke because uh, I, I have to really be careful out in the public. Obviously, people have a high expectation for what you are as a public figure, so I, I try to be careful, and, uh, you know, even as a teacher, you have to do that, too, and uh, so I, I'm really careful when I go out in public. <laughs> You know, I just keep coming back to a, a thing that happened when I was teaching grade 12. It was back before Shazam was invented as an app, as a phone app. Yeah. And on a grade 12 class, phys ed class on a Monday morning, this guy in my class says, you're, you're quite the party guy, aren't you, Fuel? I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. He said, oh, Saturday night, you were at the station, which is a pub in town. You were there till 2 a.m. And I said, no, my wife and I were there at 9 and went home. He said, no, no, I work at the station. I heard your night all your name all night. And so what happened was a team of graduates had come back for the weekend and they named their trivia team Pat Fuel. So all night long, this kid while he's working is hearing my name called out and he thinks I'm partying till 2 a.m. So even when I wasn't out in public, you have to be careful. So yeah, I, I tend to go for wings and Diet Coke. And the other thing, and I do not condone heavy alcohol use, but I'm uh, I'm hooked on uh, moonshiners uh, on, on, on television. It's a reality show. So I will typically pour myself a rye and Coke because I figure if they're making whiskey, it's the least I can do to help support them. So I'll have a rye and Coke and, and watch them do that. And that between that and the wings, I'm, I'm okay after a council meeting. Um, Mayor Fuel, my last question after you talking about moonshine, it kind of pivots <laughs> back to your community here, but 
Um, take as long as you want to answer this question, but in your opinion, what makes the town of Strathmore such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, Strathmore is probably one of the friendliest towns you'll come across. People are good to each other. They greet you in the store. They nod and smile. Their volunteerism is strong here. We had a massive blizzard in 2011, and people came out from everywhere to help stranded people, to help emergency centers set up. So yeah, the people here are amazing. Um, you have a mix of cultures. We've become a real multicultural community through immigration. Our school systems have international students coming from all over. So we've become a really multi uh, multicultural town. We have a strong ranching and farming background that's apparent when you when you meet the different farmers and ranchers of town. It's got a real Western feel as well. Uh, and the other thing that I think is amazing for Strathmore is our proximity to Calgary. So you can still take advantage of, of a large urban center like Calgary, but still come home to a larger, uh, a larger property, um, smaller town way of life. And it's just, uh, it's got all the amenities. Our school systems are strong. You can be bused to any public school in town. Uh, we have, we have so many public schools and, uh, and secondary schools and a, and a Christian academy that uh, if families are looking for a place to come where you feel welcome and, and taken care of and, and appreciated and, and just liked as a person, Strathmore is, and, and really my wife and I had chances to go back and teach in Canmore a couple of times, but we could never pull the trigger on, on leaving this place. The people were just too good. Mayor Fuel, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down, taking time out of your busy schedule. I know I said 45 minutes, but we're almost at the 50 minute mark. But thank you so much. And I, I, I respect your time. So thank you for sitting down and doing this today. Thank you for having me. It was, it was really good. And I really enjoyed your interview questions. They, they made me think, which hurts a little now, but I'll be okay. <laughs> so with that, I want to remind everyone, get out from social media and go have a conversation with somebody for at least 10 to 15 minutes a day. Helps us as a democracy, helps us as our society, and helps us just be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep talking.